responsible. All right, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 8 tonight. Uh, if you're watching on uh, online, you can uh, see the link there under the title to get the uh, study resources if you'd like. Uh, we're actually going to turn to the back page before we get into the chapter itself, because we're going to transition tonight from the, probably tonight, we may, may not get into it till next week, but from the um, last seal judgment uh, of the seven seals to the uh, trumpet judgments. And so uh, back in study six, uh, a month or so ago, we talked, uh, we looked at this little chart. This one's modified to try to bring it into line with uh, the events of the tribulation a little bit better, uh, so you can understand it a little bit better. Uh, but this is that telescopic interpretation of the three sets of judgments uh, with the tribulation timing. What I mean by telescopic, everybody understands what a telescope is. As a matter of fact, I have one in my office. I should have brought it out. But uh, if you ever, when you were a kid or you seen on television or a movie, especially those old pirate movies, they get those telescopes and it would expand out and then you can smush it back down and it would collapse in on itself. That's exactly how these three sets of judgments work. We looked back in chapter, or yeah, in chapter, study six, chapter six, out. some people think these are just three restatements of the same judgments, but they just can't be. And one of the reasons for that we're going to see tonight, because it's clear that as this seventh seal is opened by Jesus Christ, that it brings about a whole nother set of judgments with uh, different events that happen. And certainly it's characterized different. You have judgments that are uh, centered around seals on that scroll uh, that we looked at several weeks ago. So each one of those seals, as it was broken or opened, uh, a new judgment was brought. These are these are much different. These involve in angels and trumpets. Uh, a different angel is going to sound a trumpet uh, before each of these judgments happen. And then uh, down the road, when we get to the seventh trumpet, when it sounds, uh, it introduces the last set of judgments, which is the seven bowl or vile judgments, V-I-A-L, like a, a, a vial, what we would usually think of like a little uh, test tube or something like that. Bowls is better because it has the idea of the Old Testament censers or bowls that uh, uh, that incense was kept in and, and burned uh, at the temple. So that's the idea there. And we'll, we'll see that when we get to it. So, uh, we've seen the first six judgments. We had the last couple of weeks in chapter seven, that interlude or parenthetic where we got to look at the 144,000 and the multitude that was saved or will be saved out of the great tribulation. And then the great praise that was offered. We looked at last week uh, in heaven and some of those foreshadowing or looking forward uh, that the fancy word proleptically looking forward to the things that are going to happen at the end of the tribulation at the end of the kingdom uh god will wipe every tear away from their eyes and so forth there at the very end of the chapter so uh, as we look at the the judgments uh i've said before that the judgments are what help move the book along chronologically so that it takes us through the seven-year tribulation and we, we've talked in the past about the, the passages that give us that that timing, uh, both that the tribulation is seven years long. We'll get that from Matthew 24, Luke 21, Daniel 9, uh, and then also that it is divided uh, in, into three and a half year halves. Uh, and we also get that insight from the book of Daniel and uh, intimated in Matthew 24 on the Olivet Discourse as well. So uh, the tribulation begins again with the rap, not with the rapture of the church. Let's just step back a second. The rapture of the church happens at some point. It is uh, arguably the, the next event on God's prophetic calendar so far as what we have in scripture. Nothing else needs to happen for the rapture to happen it could happen at any time uh, we talk about that word imminency which means it is imminent it can happen any moment 
Uh, and as I said before, it would be so cool if it happened before I finished saying that statement and we went. Uh, but uh, maybe that'll happen. <laughs> but uh, obviously it didn't happen yet. But the rapture could happen at any moment. Uh, the next event after that is the uh, treaty between uh, the Antichrist or the beast, as he's going to be called here in Revelation, and Israel. And we looked at we've looked at some of those details in Daniel nine and Matthew twenty four. That's what starts God's prophetic clock ticking. The rapture doesn't necessarily do that. There is an there's an undefined amount of time between the rapture and that treaty between Israel and the beast. It could be at the same time. It could be uh, days. It could be weeks. Uh, there's nothing biblically that says it can't be months or years. Uh, the, the the rapture again is not tied to the uh, beginning of the 70th week of Daniel or the the tribulation period. Uh, what definitively uh, in Daniel marks the beginning of the last week of Daniel 70 weeks, which is the tribulation week or seven years, uh, is the is that treaty. So whatever time period elapses, we don't know, but the the clock starts to tick uh, when the uh, when the peace treaty is signed. Uh, the seal judgments begin sometime after that, and again, we don't have precise timing. Uh, could they happen? Uh, you know, as the peace treaty is signed, could be, could it be shortly after, maybe, could it be weeks uh, or months? It could be. Could it be a year? It could be, uh, because one of the hallmarks of the early part of the tribulation is, is the way you know we're seeing a lot of selling uh, the, this week, and we're going to see a lot of selling next month and over the next few m m uh, weeks and months. Uh, because what do we got going on? An Amber Alert or something? Yeah. Okay, um, and and I, it doesn't bother me. I just want to make sure that we're, you know we're not one of those. Storms is going to pop up all of a sudden as they want to do sometimes that we need to take action or be aware of. Um, it's not the telephone. It's not the telephone. <laughs> Rats. <laughs> I hear what I was saying. Um, it could be a year. Yeah, it could be a year. Uh, it can't be, you know, you, you got to have three and a half years before the next set of judgments, it appears. Uh, so it's probably, uh, oh, I know I say you've got a lot of selling going on. So one of the things to sell peace between the beast and the Antichrist and to try to bring this coalition of nations uh, and the world together around the beast, and now it's mine, and, the, uh, uh, and this uh, treaty with Israel would be peace. And so it, it may be that God holds off the beginning of those, those judgments until that kind of that is sorted out. But at some point during the first three and a half years, those uh, six, those seven judgments are going to happen. Now, this is interpretational when the, the last trumpet or the last seal is open. And that brings us to chapter eight, where we're going to look at tonight. But I, I my interpretation is that the last seal is probably the beginning of the uh, of the last three and a half years, which is often called the Great Tribulation. Now, it could be shortly before that, but the the the, the last seal uh, really seems to take us to that midpoint and start the time when these very severe judgments are going to fall on the earth. Uh, don't get me wrong; the first six judgments that happen in the seals uh, seal judgments are severe. But uh, it's like the old saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. And uh, after the trumpet judgments, which are even more severe, you could say the same thing at the end of those, you ain't seen nothing yet, uh, because the bowl judgments are even even more destructive and severe. And even after the bowl judgments, uh, the, you could say to the world, you, you ain't seen nothing yet, because all that's left is eternity in the lake of fire uh, for those that did not receive Christ uh, through the course of the tribulation. So let's get into chat. Well, let's take questions or comments first on timing. I know people have questions on timing. Can't be absolute with it, but um, 
you know, just over the years of, of teaching it and looking at it, this is kind of where I fall. I'm happy to be corrected when it all starts to unfold. I'm happy to say, I'm, oh, I was wrong about that. Uh, that's why I don't set it in concrete. This is a possible scenario. Anybody have any comments or questions? All right, well, let's look at chapter eight then. Verse one, when he opened the seventh seal. Now the he, if you have a, a study Bible, certainly they don't always do this in the translations, but should be capitalized because this is speaking about Jesus Christ. It's talking about the lamb uh, who uh, was as though he had been slain. That was introduced to us all the way back in chapter five. Uh, he opened the seventh seal. He's the only one that has the authority to open the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And so we have a lot of specificity in this these, these few short verses, uh, in these six verses. And that's certainly part of what would lead me to uh, conclude that this is a different set of judgments. It's not just a restatement of what God has already said. And it's also worth noting one more time that these are really going to happen. These are not, uh, these aren't images. They're not uh, metaphors. Uh, they're not allegories. These are judgments that are actually going to happen. And so as the seventh seal is opened by Christ, there's no uh, real destruction uh, to speak of, there is preparation. And so let's go to the notes and see what uh, what we can see there. First of all, as the seven seals open, John's attention is turned back to the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who opens the seventh seal. Again, he's the he, uh, verse one. Uh, the opening results in silence for about half an hour. And uh, the Greek here is Arion. <laughs> Uh, which literally means half hour. And you say, well, why is that Why is that in the notes? Why is that important? Because again, people come and say, this is all allegory. It's all symbolic. Uh, that he, that the, uh, the uh, words uh, that are used in the text are, are undefined. In, in the Greek here, you can choose any number of words, just like you can in the English. If you want to just convey a general sense of time or a little bit of time or a long time, amount of time, but look at what John chose by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He chose the Greek word, which means what? A half an hour. Now, you know, some people want to argue about this because technically there's no time on the spiritual plane. And it's not an argument worth having because God uses time and he's going to use time throughout this book of Revelation, not because He's bound by time or heaven's bound by time. He uses it for our benefit to put things in a, in a perspective we understand and uh, specifically at the time for John to understand. And so John's the one who uh, estimates or, or puts forth that it's about a half an hour. And there is that word about that is in the text as well. It's, it's uh, approximately a half an hour that there's this silence in heaven. Why is that significant? Well, you've got right there in the notes why it's significant uh because everything we've seen in heaven so far is it been silent no no it's been full of praise it's it's been regular <laughs> praise by the four living creatures uh by the elders that are before the throne the 24 elders by the angels uh that are there uh and other other individuals and groups that we've seen uh there is this constant praise there's the sound of uh, of mighty waters we saw back in uh, chapter one. And so uh, an unprecedented thing happens, uh, or I should say likely unprecedented. It may happen at other points in, uh, in, hit, in God's history, in heaven's history, I could say. 
Uh, but here is the first time we see it in Revelation, uh, and there is this silence. And the silence is probably there to reflect uh, the great situation and the events that are about to unfold uh, on the earth. And that is a, a significant difference between the first set of judgments and the second set of judgments. It's saying by the silence, by this unprecedented silence in heaven, that something consequential is about to happen. It may indicate the midpoint of the tribulation, as I mentioned earlier, coinciding with the abomination of desolation and the beginning of the great tribulation. Now, again, this is just my opinion, uh, and, and other, there are some others that hold the same opinion uh, theologically. It's not live or die. It doesn't change any doctrine. Uh, but it makes sense that this event is happening on earth where the Antichrist, as we're going to see later, and we've already seen in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, is going to set up in the temple in Jerusalem. We've talked about that at some point in all this, which, by the way, could happen before the rapture, could happen in the in-between between the rapture and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the peace treaty. Or it could happen any time in the first part of the tribulation. There's going to be a, a temple built uh, in order for the Jews to do what uh, Daniel talked about and what Jesus mentions in Matthew 24 to resume the sacrifices uh, and for the, the beast to come and call a cease to those sacrifices. In order to call a cease to sacrifices, they had to have been resumed at some time. So uh, it's, it's possible that this silence in heaven is reflective on the fact that number one we're going to have some increasingly more severe judgments but also that satan has prompted through the beast this uh this blasphemous action uh in setting up a, a an image of himself in the temple in jerusalem uh the place where uh messiah is shortly uh from this vantage point going to come and establish his kingdom and it's so severe that, that Christ calls it the that Daniel and Christ call it the abomination of desolation. And so that may be tied together. Uh, but again, it, you can take it or leave it. Uh, it doesn't affect how we interpret the whole book or how we view it. Uh, there are seven angels that are mentioned. They're given seven trumpets, uh, one trumpet each. Uh, and then a, an eighth angel carrying a golden censer, which again is a wide bowl. Uh, and in this case, carrying it, given what's in it, usually would have a, a chain uh, attached to it uh, so that you could carry these hot coals in this metal bowl uh, without getting burned. Uh, he takes this golden censer with a lot of incense in it, and he takes it to uh, the altar that is before the throne of God. Um, let's see. I scrolled too far. You may have any comments or questions before we go on. Okay. Uh, again, the censer is uh, directly tied back to the Old Testament and everything in the Old Testament tabernacle and later the temple is reflective of what is in heaven. We see that in the book of Hebrews, that essentially everything that God laid out for the tabernacle and later for the temple, it's a copy of things that are in uh, the heavenly throne room and the heavenly temple. So uh, these are the heavenly furnishings of the temple, the heavenly in implements or instruments of worship in the temple. And this angel takes this, the, the incense, he mixes it with the prayers of the saints. You say, how does that happen? Don't know, looking forward to see how it happens. But in the Old Testament tabernacle and temple, that's what the incense was for. It was, it was a, a picture of the prayers of the people of Israel. Uh, and, you know, God it, it, you know, does, is not moved by incense or moved by the smoke and even the aroma of sacrifices. He says that explicitly, especially through the prophets, as Israel drifted farther and farther away from God. Uh, he told them, you know, I'm not impressed by, I, I don't need to smell that, that incense or smell those sacrifices. As a matter of fact, he says something similar to what he said 
to the church in Laodicea in, in Revelation chapter 3. He said they, they're a, a stench in my nostrils. In Revelation 3, he told the church there, you're lukewarm, so I, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. In both cases, uh, he's saying, I don't need those uh, superficial things. What I want is, as he, David says in, in Psalm 51, a broken and contrite heart. Uh, all those other things are, when they're done right, they are reflective of a broken and contrite heart. Uh, but they've always, it's always been intended that incense in the Old Testament worship in the tabernacle and temple was intended to represent the prayers of the Old Testament saints. Here, he takes the prayers of all the saints, which may be uh, all the saints on the earth at that time, or it could be all the saints uh, of all times and the prayers that they've offered up, longing for the coming of Christ, longing for the restoration of Israel and uh, the establishment of Christ's kingdom and so forth. We simply don't know, but we know that the prayers are, are key to this and are part of uh, the worship that takes place before uh, the next set of judgments comes about. Uh, the angel's actions cause great smoke to rise before God. Uh, and, you know, smoke is used uh, throughout uh, the Old Testament as well. Can anybody think of a time when we have this great smoke uh, associated with worship or associated with the tabernacle or the temple? Anybody remember a time or an event? Well, when uh, Solomon built the first temple, and it says that uh, when they dedicated to the Lord, that he actually came in there in a cloud of smoke. Good, it yeah. Filled the room. It, it it filled the it filled the entire temple, and uh, it's it's indicative of cleansing. It's in, it, it's uh, and you know we can kind of visualize this if you've ever set off a I mean it's kind of a negative, but if you've ever set off a bug bomb in your house or in in a camper or something like that, we used to do them down at the lake house. We had a little bunkhouse that we had outside, just had, a, had four beds in it, bunk beds, uh, uh, but it would get a lot of bugs in it. And uh, if we took the, the teens down there, uh, some of them wouldn't want to sleep in there because of the spiders. So we'd always make sure we set off a bug bomb before we left and try to keep the bugs down. But, uh, you know, you set that thing off and close the door and lock the door. And if there's a place for that smoke to escape, it starts, you know, coming out the eaves or, or under the door or whatever. Uh, and, and this is similar in the sense that the presence of God in the temple, uh, when Solomon completed the temple and gave his prayer of dedication, you have this smoke fill the temple was indicating the presence of God, but it was also indicating a final purification of the temple that it was ready, it was, uh, it was ready to be used to worship God. Uh, and there's a similarity to this here. There's this great smoke uh, that rises up before God. It it represents the, the again the prayers of the saints, but it it has that idea that the prayers of the saints, how, however that works before God, works with the will of God when we pray according to the will of God to uh, to accomplish uh, what God wants to do. Uh, and then the angel does something uh, interesting, and it's in line with the other things that we saw in the seal judgments. He takes the fire and the coals from the altar, and he throws it to the earth. And at, when he does that, the fire and coals cast to the earth by the angel result in noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And what, what we talked about in the first set of judgments, in the seal judgments, is we have these very visual visual things that happen in heaven that don't necessarily happen in the same way on earth, but they have results on the earth. So we saw the four horsemen ride out one at a time uh, in heaven. And John saw these horsemen, uh, these either angelic or demonic horsemen ride out. And uh, John saw them. He was able to describe them, even to the color of the horses and what they were holding and so forth. But it doesn't mean that the people on earth are going to see, you know, this horse and rider come out of the sky. They are going to see that later in uh, Revelation 19, when Christ comes with all his saints, that's an event that all of earth sees. 
John and the and the folks in heaven and the uh, the beings in heaven see the things from the first judgments happen in heaven, but they're not necessarily seen on earth. But what is uh, seen on earth are the effects. And so you have the writer that comes out and fan and results on the earth. And you have the writer that comes out and war results on earth. We have the same thing here. Doesn't mean that, you know, the, the, at this point that the fire and, uh, uh, and such is going to happen. Although we do get to see that there is going to be hail and fire, uh, mingle with blood come down in the first trumpet. But uh, whether that's the same as this, we don't know. But what we do know is he throws this to the earth and the results are not necessarily fire falling on the earth, but it is noise, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake. And it is most likely letting the earth know, letting mankind know whether they recognize it as a sign from God or not that uh, something significant is coming. This next set of judgments is coming. All right, before we get into the trumpet judgment. So that's the seventh seal. Or seventh seal. That's the last one. Uh, and as that is open, it it bring it paves the way for the, the next set of judgments. How much questions, Marty? Uh, this, uh, when the angel cast down this uh, sensor, uh, uh -huh. it doesn't look like it's going to be a localized event on the earth. It looks like it's going to be worldwide. Yeah, that's a, that's a good observation. All of the judgments are worldwide. They have effects across the whole earth. And we're going to see that more specifically in these trumpet judgments uh, because of the terminology that John uses um, in, in the results. For example, in this next, in this first trumpet, it says a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. And I should go back before that. He says they were thrown to the earth. And all the, the third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass. So it is not just suggestive. It's a statement that this is a worldwide event. This is uh, this is the, the flood event uh, on steroids, if you will, because we're going to have successive judgments that affect the entire earth. It's not just in Israel. Uh, it's not just in Babylon, wherever Babylon may be indicative of. As we get later in the book of Revelation, it has consequences on the whole earth because by this time, the whole earth has begun to follow after Antichrist, uh, except for those that have come to faith in Christ and those uh, and, and are uh, protected by God. So good, good observation. You're right. Anyone else? Well, what about this is the seventh seal. The prayers of the saints. And so that would be the believers that are left here on earth, right? Possibly, yeah. It could be could be just those. It could be uh, the prayers that have been offered from times past, from uh, all, all the way back. And the suggestion that from that interpretation, it's going all the way back to Adam when God first made um, uh, a promise of a redeemer. And from that time forward, uh, even though we don't have, you know, every member of every generation recorded praying for God's redemption, uh, the suggestion is that as the as uh, the oral history of, of uh, God's promises is passed down, and then later as Moses records them, uh, that that uh, a, at least a remnant of people were praying for God's redemption, and then later specifically praying. For the one that Moses said would come after him, that would be like him, uh, but greater than him. And then later, when we get the, the Davidic covenant, praying specifically for Messiah. And then now, for us today, as the church, praying for the return of Jesus Christ. Because we, we, we have all this information that uh, hooks together and gives us the full picture eventually. So there's two schools of thought on that, Randy, that it could just be the believers on the earth at that time, but it could be that God has stored up, as we're going to see, he stored up judgment, uh, that he stored up the prayers of faithful saints, Old Testament saints, and New Testament saints as well, uh, that have prayed for this event, the, the culmination of all things, 
and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Even though all those believers would be raptured. Yes, even, even though they've gone on either in God's presence or uh, again, the disposition of the, the Old Testament saints is not super clear whether they're resurrected yet or whether they're resurrected at the kingdom. Don't know. But, uh, you know, how God does that, I don't know. Uh, but one way or the other, there are lots of prayers at this time that God's going to uh, mingle with the uh, uh, the incense in the heavenly realm. Yeah, I mean, the only, only reason of I mean, thinking about that is because it, it talks about uh, the prayers of the martyrs. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah, uh, crying out how long uh, and uh, crying out that God would avenge him. Yeah, and it, I, I think they'd certainly, it, it, I, I don't really take a side on it because we, I, we just don't have enough information. It just says the prayers of all the saints. So it's not, it doesn't, uh, it, it's not, uh, specific enough for us to say it's only them, uh, but prayers are a powerful thing, you know? and so it's not that we need all the prayers from all the way back to Adam, but it could be uh, God values prayer. He always has valued prayer. He still does. He's, he will, obviously, here in Revelation, so it's one more reminder for us, and something we've been focusing on, uh, you know, monthly, uh, and regularly, uh, just the importance of going to the Lord in prayer, certainly with individual needs. But boy, as we see things unfold in our country and in the world and in Israel, uh, we need to be praying because they're in, God values prayer. And it's not that we're going to change the will of God. It's that we're going to pray according to the will of God. And that even as God's will is done, that people will see their need for Christ and will come to know him as their savior. Amen. Anyone else? Well, let's take a look at that first trumpet. Uh, it'll be better than that. Uh, the first angel sounded and the result, so much like Jesus op opens each seal and the result is, uh, here's what happens. Uh, the first trumpet sounds, the first angel sounds his trumpet and hail and fire followed. <clears throat> and so we have a an action, a sound by the angel and the result. Uh, what followed that sound, hail and fire followed and mingled with blood and they were thrown to the earth and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Now, again, John sees and hears events in heaven will the earth hear that trumpet don't know uh probably not and you say how would you what would be your basis well it would be the same basis as uh paul's conversion uh on the road to uh damascus in Acts chapter 9 and you recall that uh you know paul saw and heard everything he saw christ and he heard christ's voice uh, but we're repeatedly, you know, we have those that were with him uh, heard something, but they did and they saw light, but they didn't hear specifically. And so, you know, this is to me uh, very much like what goes on today. <laughs> uh, Caleb's been in Romans. Romans makes clear that uh, that God has given us creation as a witness. The book of Psalms tells us that uh, the the uh, the heavens declare the glories of God in in Psalm 19. Uh, if we walk out here, and and I think it's important to say when we walk out into God's creation, not necessarily in here. This is our creation, okay? This this building and the lights and the the tiles and all that, you know, as nice as it is, and it keeps us cool and keeps the rain and snow off our heads. But this is our creation. This this. This really doesn't speak. Within here, it's we who speak. We speak uh, by praising God. We speak by preaching and teaching the word and by encouraging one another. But we can we get so kind of impressed with what we have uh, that we forget all too often. When we step out there, that's speaking all the time. The, the trees are speaking and the grass is speaking, the, the, the sky is speaking, and the clouds are speaking, and you say, oh, you talking about Mother Nature? Of course not. I, said, I appreciate what Donna said in her and Steve's 
testimony a few weeks ago that that's one of her trigger terms, <laughs> uh, mother nature. There is no mother nature. Uh, God has ordained all those things to speak. And, you know, one of the only other things he says specifically uh, that uh, don't have the power of speech that speak praise, by the way, and, and uh, Carlos going to have an example of this not too long. Is 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 babies? It says that out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, I have ordained praise. They can't say anything, yet, but God has ordained praise. Isn't that cool? Uh, we we speak the wrong words and we mess it up. But babies, I think, even in their even in their cries, uh, God has ordained praise in that. And so the. Uh, the rocks and the hills, we're told in Scripture, cry out. The trees cry out. Everything is crying out the glory of God. Uh, and we, we are deaf to it. And my point, long point, long way to the point, is uh, God could sound all the trumpets of heaven. And if the earth, if mankind has got their fingers in their spiritual ears, they're not going to hear it. And that's what's happening now. God has sounded the trumpets of heaven, so to speak, in the and sending the church out to uh, spread the gospel and in creation and in all the things that God has ordained to communicate the message of the gospel, if the earth, if mankind does not care to hear it, they're not going to hear it. So at this point in the tribulation, uh, we are down to uh, those that have more than likely the vast majority, if not all, have made up their mind. They've either hardened their heart to not hear God, God's word, or they have made the decision to follow Christ and literally put their life on the line. Uh, but they will see the results. So again, we have action in heaven, sound in heaven. The results happen on earth. And the result is fire, and, I'm sorry, hail and fire. Uh, and then it's mingled with blood. And so uh, this could be a couple of things. Uh, it could be volcanic eruptions related to the earthquake couple of verses back. It could be, again, meteors or asteroids uh, coming from the sky. It could be, again, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, man-made objects falling out of, of space, just the amazing number of satellites and space you know, junk that is floating above us is a little bit scary. Uh, don't bump your head during the rapture. Um, never mind. Boy, you guys are tough. Well, I didn't tell the other joke earlier. I would have gotten a colder reception. Uh, and, and quite, quite, you know, the easiest explanation for these things, and I, I really, it could be any of those things. I always favor is just a supernatural act of God, that God is causing things to fall out of the sky uh, that, are, that are part of his judgment. What is the blood? Well, the blood could be a number of things. It could, if things fall out of the sky, <laughs> There are there are birds and, and such in the sky. Uh, we could even assume there are still planes in the sky. And so as things fall out of the sky and knock other things out of the sky, it's uh, it's quite easy to see just as a matter of logic that there can be blood mingled with the uh, the uh, hail and fire that falls out of the sky. Uh, and it, it also in the Greek it indicates anything that looks like blood. So it could be something else that God has uh, sent upon the earth that uh, that looks like blood. But uh, this is a significant judgment. It's one verse, one verse, verse seven. But look how significant it is. One third of the trees of the earth are burned up. I looked this up uh, anew uh, today. Uh, as I was uh, polishing up the notes, and uh, currently in 2024, 30% of the earth is covered by trees. That's 4.2 billion hectares of the earth. And I didn't figure further to see what 30% of that would be, but it would be what, uh, 12, 12 billion, over 12 billion. No, that's not right. Uh, anyway. So lot of trees. you guys that are, yeah, a lot of trees. Thank you. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck? <laughs> if a woodchuck could chuck wood. It's a lot of trees. Now, again, here's the, uh, where we see that domino effect. What happens if you get rid of 30% of all the trees on the earth? 
Well, you, lose a lot of oxygen. you lose a lot of oxygen. You lose a lot of food because uh, a good number of trees produce fruit, uh, produce uh, you know resources for uh, you know, all manner of things. And so it has a, a domino effect on the economy as well as the ecology uh, and, and it's instantaneous. It doesn't tell us that this is a one day event or one week event, uh, as we see going back to God judging Egypt uh, in Exodus. Uh, some of those uh, stretched out for, uh, you know, were just single day events. Some of them stretched out over a course of days or weeks. Uh, so God doesn't tell us, uh, but the effect is certainly going to be long term because you also have a third of the grass. Well, the grass is also something that uh, is, you know, all the green things are part of the process of helping to uh, cleanse carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and produce oxygen. Uh, and also what, what effect would a third of the grass, which by the way is 20 to 40% of the earth is covered by grass and the uh, big span there is, as I was reading, is because it depends on what you consider grass. Uh, so I would I would lean towards the 40 percent because uh, it, it doesn't what we think of grass is different than what they think of grass in Africa and so forth. But I would lean more towards the, the bigger percentage. How is this going to have an effect if 40 percent food supply and we to have food to eat? Yes. Uh, the anim if the animals that people eat don't have grass to eat uh, and again, expanding that and say if it takes in things like uh crops and so forth and that's the the kind of the discrepancy here i think it probably does it's talking about anything that's planted uh that is not tree but is uh but is grassy uh then you you again you're going to have a, a ripple effect through the world's economy the world's ecology and if this is what God uses or what is part of the famine that was introduced back in the seal or the, yeah, the seal judgments, or if this is an addition to, oh my goodness, the, uh, the, the effects on the world in a relatively short period of time, if we're at the midpoint of the tribulation in three and a half years would just be absolutely devastating. You know, I think it's noteworthy that he doesn't say a third of the grass. He says a third of all the green grass is burned up. Yeah. So, you know, how does you have to heat has to be pretty high to burn up green grass. Yeah, I hope you all heard that. I hadn't thought about that. But, you know, you can, I don't know if you've ever tried to to start grass on fire, if it's still green, it doesn't work too well because it's it's got a lot of moisture in it. Uh, but when you get into August, uh, typically, and it's, uh, you know, they'll have burn bans and red flag warnings here in the Midwest uh, and elsewhere, and you start hearing about wildfires. Why is that? Because the grass is dry. Uh, the, the specificity here is to indicate you know, it's not just that dried up old grass. It's the grass that's used for food. It's the things that are growing that are used for food. The intensity of uh, the heat from the fire and hail is going to be sufficient to destroy those things that uh, the world would depend on for food. That's part of the judgment. And so the effects of the first judgment, again, uh, will contribute to the famine and death already experienced on the earth following the seven seal judgments. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, nope. You're stretching your head. You know, uh, talking about green grass, uh, if you've ever used a propane weed burner, yeah, burn green weeds, it takes a while for that green to get dry enough to where it actually then begins to burn. So, it's whether this is going to be instantaneous or whether it's going to be a process of uh, but... Yeah, and under, understand this is what God has uh, has set forth uh, as far as some specifics. But if you have hail and fire coming from heaven, what else is going to be burned up? It doesn't mean that buildings are going to be exempt. Uh, there's going to be a lot of roofing contractors out. You know, <laughs> I don't think they're going to be worried about that. 
given the, the state of the earth at this time. But uh, again, vehicles, um, communications, uh, just, you know, it, it, is, it is impossible to imagine the scope of devastation that uh, these these initial judgments have already caused, and again, it, it ain't seen nothing yet. So, anyone else? Jim, my translation says all green grass. It doesn't give the third. Uh, it says the trees. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Oh, you're right. So does mine. Oh, that's an error on my part. I apologize. Yeah, that should be. So mark out a third. And I carried it down and I messed up. So I should say all green grass. So let's fix that right now. Is this in verse seven? Yeah. What do you have? F, the third part of trees. Okay. That just means a third of. But what does it say about grass? Oh, yeah. Oh, this well, yeah, that's what she's asking about, and I'm. I, I'd have to go back in uh, and add a third of the earth was burned. Yeah, there's some translational issues, and that's probably where I have this. But I would, since I'm using the King James, when I first did this study, I think I was using a, a different translation, but we're using King James and I, our new King James. I should have caught that. I apologize. I King James. Okay, the standard, it, says all. it says all also. Okay. What does all mean? All means all. Change that. Thank you. Okay, so that's even more consequential um, that uh, it's a third of the trees, but all of the green grass. Uh, and Do you know what the green grass is all burned up? All that dead dry grass is too. Is too, yeah. It's a given. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I apologize for that uh, that mistake on the notes. We'll get that fixed. Seems 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 to me that there's a it's like a correlation between the plagues in Egypt and what we're going to see due to what the unbelievers <laughs> are believing at that time. Yeah. You know, all the plagues in Egypt were from their gods that they worshipped basically, and now. We're seeing people tell us that we should be eating bugs and not meat. This came from me, meat bugs, and uh, the earth is more important than people. And uh, well, the, the, the term that they're throwing around the university now it's about uh, the earth. Biodiversity. Yeah. Uh, uh, climate change and climate things like change that. And all that. Yeah, one of the things that we talked about at the last time that we looked at this in uh, 2013, I think, uh, is it's interesting how many of these, if you step back from them, and it's hard for me to do because I just shake my head at a lot of the climate change stuff. Um, but if you step back from these, it's going to be easy for Antichrist or or whoever to say, oh, this is just climate change. We've been trying to tell you for years this is going to happen. Uh, and look, it's happening. And instead of saying this is the hand of God, it's just climate change. And it's all our fault. Uh, and so that's a, that's a great connection. Um, the other thing that is so important about what Randy said is the purpose of these judgments again is we, we get it we get it kind of backwards it's not about punishment it's about trying to change hardened hearts and that was the purpose of the the, the plagues in egypt it wasn't that god delights in, in punishing it delighted in punishing the egyptians what well, was the constant refrain it was uh, that Pharaoh relented, but then uh, his heart was hardened. Uh, he hardened his heart. Or later, that God hardened his heart, and that's a whole different conversation. But uh, all that means is that God gave it, let him have the hard heart he wanted. It didn't mean that God intervened and said, I'm trying to change your heart, but I'm not going to let your heart change. Uh, it's that God turned him over, as Re Romans says, it's really the 
the outflow of what we see later in the New Testament, that God turned him over to his desires. And the same thing's happening here. God is doing these things with the gracious hope that mankind will hear the trumpet, you know, that they'll hear that this is coming from God. But man's conclusion is, oh no, it's, it, it, this is, this is, you know, whatever they're going to conclude, climate change or alien invasion or, or whatever, uh, or just happenstance. And they'll, they'll come, they'll reason what Roger, my pastor always said, they, they will reason logically to a wrong conclusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, I saw that today, by the way, not to veer off into politics, but the, the current vice president got up and, and uh, said, you know, we, and I guess it's the first time she's spoken publicly since the assassination attempt is, we, well, I agree with the president, we need to set aside uh, this this rhetoric and this, hard, this violent rhetoric, and there's never an excuse for violence, and uh, and it, it just can't happen in the political discourse in the greatest democracy in the world. Uh, and, uh, and so she just really, did, you know, we can't be talking about violence. We can't be engaged in violence. And so uh, that's why I'm here today. And I, I want to go and have this discussion about reproductive rights and abortion with these people. And I thought, what a, how ironic one of the most violent things we can do as a society is to kill children. And, uh, and, and here we're going to, I'm going to talk about violence, but we're going to go talk about violence. Uh, but they don't see the connection is my point. I guess I'm going to make political statements. It's there. They don't get the connection and it's, we get angry. Uh, but again, it's got to take us to our knees in prayer because the, the, the poor woman who believes she's a believer, uh, if you can't make that connection, uh, I, I have to call in the question, and it's you know it's ultimately not my mind to call into, it's God's call into, but you have to call in to question if somebody knows Christ, they can't see a connection there. Uh, and the same thing happened in Egypt, the same thing happened in Israel, the same thing was happening in, the, in some of those early churches in Revelation 2 and 3, uh, God is trying to do, soften their hearts, and it's happening today. And then it's going to happen on a grand scale at the, in the end times. God is trying to call out to the hardened hearts of the world, but let's not get cocky uh, today. He's calling out to those hearts. He's also calling out to our apathetic hearts as believers uh, to see the needs and to make sure that the, the, the first thing in, on our minds and in our, our hearts day to day is to is to take the gospel message to this world and be part of the trumpet be part of that uh what god is trying to break through and uh, graciously offer salvation to those that don't know him all right we'll come back to uh, the second trumpet next week uh for those of you that are watching i'll have a corrected copy of the notes and i apologize again for the error and thank you for those that were diligently following and caught the error tonight. We'll be back next week, uh, maybe in here, maybe in there. It depends. It's Vacation Bible School, so it depends on which which room is less beat up. Uh, oh. Jim, to what you were saying about these aren't judgments at this point. God's just trying to get their attention, change their hearts. Uh let, let me no, let me it. modify a little bit. They are judgments, but the part a big part of the purpose is to try to try to break through hardened hearts. Well, I agree with that, but we we see the word bold judgments right. used in chapter 15 is that that's where the, the true wrath of God yes. starts to flow. Yeah, and when we see that. What what was can somebody tell me about the judgments in Egypt uh, as it pertained to the Egyptians and the Israelites? What was there a distinction? Yeah. What happened? Israel had food, water. <laughs> Egypt didn't have. They had phantom yeah. crystals, frogs. Yeah, the Amazon dying. The, salvation. the Jews were unaffected by the plagues. And the Egyptians were not. And so there's a, a thought process, and especially, and we do, we are going to see this in the last judgments that God shelters 
the remaining Jew Jewish believers and Gentile believers in the wilderness uh, during the closing days of the, the tribulation. So it's very clear that the judgments that are affecting the rest of the world are not going to affect that group of people. God is shelt at that time when we get to the end of the tribulation, God is sheltering those folks to go into the kingdom and he will preserve them through the remainder of the tribulation. Now through the rest of the tribulation, you have believers that uh, that live and you have believers that die, that are martyred, perhaps some believers that are killed in uh, the aftermath or the effects of the judgments. Maybe we don't know because if, if the parallel is with what happened in Egypt, God sustained the Jews uh, and brought them to that last plague as long as they were faithful. What they have to do to survive that last plague uh, or for their firstborn to survive that last plague. Put the blood on the door they had to put the blood on the doorpost. They had to observe the Passover, put the blood on the doorpost, and I will pass over you. Uh, and so that would be possibly indicative of believers during the tribulation that they they have to be believers and they have to make their stand for the Lord. And that, that would be why we would say uh, that we'd often conclude that if a, if someone comes and says, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, but you know, I'm going to cover all my bases. I'm going to go take the mark of the beast so I can get food for the church or I can get food for my family. Uh, and that may be one of those uh, very same things that we had in Egypt, where if, if a Jew did not, believe and by faith put that blood on the doorpost then uh, the firstborn in that house died uh, and we have might have a similar situation in, in the tribulation now that definitively don't know doesn't tell us for sure but it sure seems like uh, a, a powerful parallel when we look at uh, these uh, these judgments uh, that God is is uh, giving mankind an opportunity by the time we get to the bold judgments it appears there's no more opportunities and we're going to see why when we get closer to that uh that everybody who's made everybody's made their choice at that time and uh if they've hardened their hearts they're hardened against god and they cannot come back from that so all right we'll come back and uh, if you have further questions uh, jot them down we'll come back to this next week